welcome everyone to today's wildlife program, which we're broadcasting live from Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village, Ohio. My name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I am here representing uh, the partner Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, who is hosting these wildlife programs during the month of February in collaboration with Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Today's program is about baby animals. And before we go on, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the center and about these programs. Today, we're joined by presenters Christine Barnett, who is Wildlife Program Specialist at the center, and Tim Jasinski, Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist also at the center. We are going to be learning a lot, so it'll be a very interesting program. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, and before I do that, I'd like to ask you just to keep your mic uh, muted during the program to help us cut back on background noises. Uh, if you have a comment or a question that you'd like to make, please either write it in the chat and we'll bring it up for you or um, unmute yourself and ask uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you so much. Here again is the beautiful logo and uh, information, a little bit more information about the center. And to our right, we have a great picture of Tim Jasinski, Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, holding, I believe, a wood duck that is a patient at the center. As you can see, we've had a full roster of February programs every Monday at noon. These are very special programs talking all about the nature of wildlife rehabilitation and all of the different services and amenities that this lovely center, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, offers that's nestled in the community of the far west Cleveland area, Bay Village, Ohio. And today, as I mentioned, if you look down at the bottom of the slide, the yellow highlighted area Today's program is Baby Season. Does Baby Wildlife Really Need Our Help? And what we're going to learn about from our friends is that many people see a furry baby animal and immediately want to help. Hasn't that, or isn't that always the case? Sometimes baby animals need a helping hand, but most of the time our good intentions can become more harmful than helpful. So in today's program, we're going to learn a little bit more from Christine and Tim about when to intervene and when to leave the baby alone. Here are some lovely photos of baby animals and birds and mammals just to help us get started. These are photos courtesy of the center. Aren't they sweet? Here is the center. Uh, if you look at your slide, on the left-hand side is a picture of the center in springtime. Springtime's coming up, believe it or not. Um, the second, the middle and right photos show pictures of youth wildlife rehabilitation interns at the center, uh, where they uh, work with the animals that are residents there and I believe uh, in a special capacity can help out with the rehabilitation of patients at the center. Something else that's a very important component of Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is that they are one of many regional organizations that are part of something called Lights Out Ohio. And this in particular is our local regional branch of Lights Ohio called Lights Out Cleveland. So it's a group of local partnering organizations who work together to create awareness about the effects that brightly lit buildings have on migrating birds. And let's just talk about that just for one moment. Here we can see the uh, part of uh, an extensive team of volunteer monitors 
and this I would imagine is the, in the very early morning hours in Cle downtown Cleveland. So the center has been a major catalyst in the volunteering, volunteer monitoring program. And here we see Tim Jasinski, dead center, right in the middle of the photo with uh, uh, volunteers who go down to help uh, identify pickup, identify uh, birds who have unfortunately collided with lit buildings in their evening or uh, night migration. The uh, wildlife that have are, are captured or um, picked up, the ones who are uh, have some chance for recovery go to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center there and under their care um, hopefully recover and then look toward a, a uh, release. These are some of the birds that have been picked up by the monitoring, monitoring volunteers and brought to the center hopefully for a recovery. The uh, wildlife, the birds that do not uh, uh, live are taken to uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History where they are um, documented and archived for research study. So Lake Erie Nature and Science Center has successfully released over 700 birds during 2017 alone. I'm sure these numbers have increased substantially since then. As I mentioned, they do host a volunteer monitoring program, and you can learn much more about it and where to sign up if you're interested by visiting ohiolightsout.org and then the Lights Out Cleveland. Here is, um, I wanted to also tell you that Lake Erie Nature and Science Center abuts, and if you look at the uh, image on the left, the map, uh, you'll see the red circle. The red circle identifies where the center is located. And this is a map, a map provided courtesy of the Cleveland Metro Parks, which you can go to their website. And I've detailed the link at the bottom there. You can go to their website and print off this map. Um, but taking a closer look at the map, you can see that the large green region that's uh, identified there is um, Huntington Reservation. This is a part of the Greater Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Metro Park's Emerald Necklace. And you can see how if you follow the uh, river, the creek, it'll take you all the way to the shores of Lake Erie. And that's exactly what the photograph of the birding group on the right is doing. They're on their way probably started at the center where they park and meet up uh, and then walk and bird watch all the way to the shore uh, of the lake going through Huntington Reservation. Before we begin our program, my last uh, invitation to you is to please make a generous donation to the center. And I've identified here in several points how you can do that, and a little bit more information. So Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I've listed the tax ID there, a number for you, and also uh, in the first top yellow highlighted link, the direct link where you can go to make a donation that goes directly to the center's account. The second thing you can do is go on Facebook, if you are a member of Facebook, and go there and like the Lake Erie Nature and Science page if you haven't done so already. When you're there, go and look for the bright blue Donate button at the top of their page and click on it. There you can make a cash donation that again goes directly to the center. The third way that you can make a donation is to write a check. And you can mail your checks to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 28728 Wolf Road, Bay Village, Ohio, 44140. 
And if you would like, finally, to learn more about these programs uh, and in detail and where you could watch them, please go and visit uh, the WC Audubon website and look for the article, Make a Donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. And I've listed the link there. So, all right, here we go. Here is our program, Baby Season, Does Baby Wildlife Really Need Our Help? With Christine Barnett and Tim Jasinski. Please hang on a minute and we will make our uh, slides change here. Just a moment. Uh, the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center uh, is located in uh, Huntington Reservation, which is part of the Cleveland Metro Park. But we are a private nonprofit, which means that we can do a couple of things that you might not see in other areas of the Metro Park. Um, one of those is that we have one of two public planetariums uh, that you can come to and visit. Uh, the other thing that uh, makes us really cool and that we're going to be talking a lot about today is we do something called wildlife rehabilitation uh, where we can't take in hurt or injured animals um, once in a while orphaned animals but we'll get around to that um, not not terribly often uh, but if you find an injured animal or even if you find a baby animal uh, you can please call us first so before you pick it up before you approach it Give us a call. If it's an injured animal, we can give you some information on how to properly and safely uh, get a hold of that animal uh, and even talk to you about whether or not that animal really needs to come in to the rehabilitation program. So we've got uh, both of our phone numbers up there as well as our email address. So if you have a uh, photograph of the animal, you're not sure what it is, you can always send us an email with a photograph so we can help you to identify that animal and again, identify whether or not it needs to come in to our wildlife rehabilitation program. And if we take a look at the next slide, when uh, people think about baby season and think about wildlife rehabilitation, a lot of times they think about babies and baby animals. Um, anytime that you're in a field where you're working with animals, People always think that you get a chance to cuddle uh, these animals and love them and snuggle on them. And that is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. We want wildlife to stay wild. So our goal is to rehabilitate uh, those injured or hurt animals. Um, and when we release them back into the wild, uh, them still being wild enough to be able to do all of the things that they need to do. And the same thing is true when it comes to baby animals. One of the worst things that you can do is get a baby animal to be comfortable with humans. So we're going to talk a lot today about uh, the different things that you can do or maybe don't want to do um, when it comes to baby animals. So even though they look cute and cuddly uh, for their survival, for their well-being, uh, a lot of times the best thing to do is to not interfere. So we're going to take a look at when baby animals actually do need a little bit of help and when they don't. And uh, Tim is the guy in charge of rehab. He's there uh, five out of the seven days a week. Uh, so we're going to be hearing a lot of expertise um, uh, from him and a little bit from myself. Uh, but uh, we're going to have a good time today and hopefully get to see some cute baby pictures and uh, let you know what you can do to help wildlife as well. Do you want to go to the next slide? So you want me to talk about this, Christine? You want me to do this slide? Okay. Go for it, Tim. So May and June are our busiest months um, at the center here. Um, baby season can really go from January to December, depending on what you're dealing with. Um, pigeons have babies now. Great horned owls have babies now. Raccoons, squirrels are starting soon. So um, you know we kind of babies pretty much all year round, but there's a concentration of of it being what we consider busy season. And May and June are our busiest months. Uh, we, in a normal given year, not a COVID year, we, we um, have an interaction with the public about every six minutes from an injured animal coming in or a phone call or, you know, when we used to have people coming to the center uh, at the front desk, um, you know, so that's, it gets pretty crazy here. Um, we take about 4,000 calls a year from, from the public asking about 
anything from why is this bird attacking my window to I found an injured animal that needs help or what bird seed can I use or when do the hummingbirds come back. So, you know, we have many different questions that we can, that we can, uh, we get every year and we, we offer many different uh, advice for, for the public and it's, it's fun to be able to help the people and the animals. Um, we admit annually about 3,000 animals a year. That's counting lights out birds um, alive and the ones that are passed, unfortunately. Um, Actually, no, that's just alive. Um, so about 1,000 birds come in alive um, from Lights Out Cleveland alone in a given uh, year. And we have about over 1,000, 160 species um, of animals that we admit, um, from hummingbirds to bald eagles to um, all kinds of cool stuff. So you never know what you're going to get, and that's why rehab's so fun. It's because, you know, we don't know what's going to come in until that phone rings, and then we figure out what it is. So, you know, we care from all kinds of different species. So, um, it, uh, it's, it gets pretty crazy <laughs> during the busy season, uh, but that's, I love it. It's just so much fun. Go to the next slide. Do you want to talk about this, Christine? <clears throat> sure. As Tim said, uh, it's time for those raccoons uh, to start finding their dens, start having their babies. Um, as the raccoons are having their babies, especially those moms, they're going to start getting really hungry because they're caring for their young. And so they're going to be venturing out a lot. This is a time that a lot of people will start to see adult raccoons in their area. And unfortunately, because they're seeing more raccoon activity, because that mom's so busy taking care of her babies, it's also the time that people start trapping raccoons. So if you think about this, mom's out running around, that's why you're seeing her. You trap her. And unfortunately with raccoons, uh, once you trap them, there is no way to get that raccoon back. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, raccoons that are trapped are euthanized, uh, but then we get a lot of calls of, oh, I had the raccoons trapped at my house, and three days later, I'm hearing all this uh, crying and yelling, and there were babies up in the attic or up in the garage. So if you are seeing a lot more raccoon activity, the very best thing to do is to give that mom an opportunity to move her babies to a different location. Um, and there are some ways to encourage her to do that. Uh, first of all, you can tell where mom is or where she's going by looking at your building. Sometimes you can actually see their paw prints or their tracks climbing up and down the side of your house or up and down the side of your garage. So it's gonna give you an idea of, okay, I've seen a lot of raccoons, where's this raccoon hanging out? Um, so if you can see those marks, you know where they're at. Once you figure out where the raccoon is nesting, if it's nesting, in your home, somewhere that you don't want it to be nesting, instead of trapping mom and trying to trap all of those babies, the best thing to do is get mom to go ahead and move her babies on her own. They'll usually have a couple of different den sites, uh, so she has somewhere else picked out that she could move those babies to. So what you wanna do is make where her and her babies are, if it's in your home um, or somewhere that you don't want them, make it unattractive. So if she wants someplace quiet and dark where her babies are just nestled in, so if you can flip that and make that area a loud area, a bright area, so running an extension cord, say, up into your attic and plugging in um, a radio with a radio turned on and a light and leaving that uh, that way for a couple of days, it's going to be loud, it's going to be bright. Mom's not going to want to hang out there, and she's going to want to go ahead and take her babies somewhere else. So that gives her a chance to take those babies, um, and now you don't have a situation where, uh-oh, I trapped mom and I've got these babies, now what can I do with them? Um, so we definitely wanna give mom a chance to move and take those babies with her, so that you're not left with uh, baby raccoons that there really is nothing that you can do with, unfortunately. Um, there are a lot of other animals that you can do the same thing. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. There we go. Uh, the other animals that we get a lot of calls about are skunks and groundhogs because they're under your porch, they're under your back shed, under your garage. Um, when people think about skunks, automatically, of course, they think of, ah, oh, it's going to spray, right? Um, skunks use that uh, ability to spray as one of their very last um, defenses. They're going to run away first, right? Something scary is coming, I'm going to run away. Um, they might get really big and poofy and show their teeth or show their claw. Oh, well, they're not going to show their teeth. They're going to stomp their feet really, really hard. Um, 
and they're going to poof up their tail. They're going to try to look really big. Um, and usually you're going to get those warning signs well before they spray. They're only going to spray when they're startled. Uh, so having skunks in your yard really doesn't have to be this big scary thing. Uh, the only time that you get into trouble with skunks is if your dog is out there because that tends to be what usually gets sprayed. They usually don't catch those skunk warning signs and they get right up on top of that, uh, that skunk after the skunk's already stomped its feet and shown its teeth. Um, that's usually when we get into a little bit of trouble. But if you don't have to worry about your dog going out there, seeing baby skunks in your yard is one of the most fun, uh, cutest, most rewarding things to see growing up in your yard. So if you can leave that den under your porch or under your, um, your shed, uh, having that opportunity to look at those small skunks and that wildlife is actually very, very, very cool. Um, if you do need either the skunks or, in the other hand, um, groundhogs uh, to move out, you're going to do very much the same thing that you did with the raccoons. So making the area where they're living bright, making it noisy, making it so that they don't want to be there. Now with raccoons, skunks, and groundhogs, um, it's really important once you get them to move and take their babies away that you block off the area so they can't get back in. Uh, groundhogs, they love to dig. They're going to dig all kinds of different burrows. Uh, underneath the ground, they're down there defecating uh, and really uh, putting a lot of nutrients into the soil. So having groundhogs, if you're trying to grow nice trees, you're trying to grow nice plants, having groundhogs in your yard that are uh, depositing those things underground can be really, really great. Uh, when they move, they have to go and find a new place. Skunks, if you get rid of your groundhogs and you don't block that section off, a skunk will move right into that groundhog hole. So you want to make sure uh, whether you're getting rid of the raccoons or the groundhogs or the skunks that you're actually um, blocking off that area. So before you block the area, you can shove the holes full of newspaper, things like that, just to make sure that there's no activity. Nobody's coming in and out anymore. And then you can go ahead and uh, block those areas off. With things that like to dig, like skunks and woodchucks, um, it's a good idea to make sure that your barrier is nice and deep underground, up to two feet below the ground, um, around any area where you don't want the groundhogs or the skunks digging back under. Um, but like I said, having things like skunks and groundhogs in your yard isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially if you love to watch baby animals grow up. Um, skunks are one of the most entertaining animals that you can watch grow. And they're really, um, unless your dog's out there and not leaving those skunks alone, uh, they're really not going to uh, cause a whole bunch of damage or even cause a whole bunch of stink um, if they don't get scared. Exactly. And one thing that I wanted to mention, too, that you, you didn't uh, touch on, Christine, was that um, it is illegal to release wildlife in the metro park. So that's one of the questions we have with the trapping is, oh, I can just release in the metro parks and that's not legal. Um, you know, as Christine said, you, you, there's nothing we can do with trapped raccoons or other animals in our, in our county unless it's trapped or released on the same property. So um, you cannot release them in the metro parks. That's illegal. <laughs> um, so some of the first animals, besides the ones that Chrissy had mentioned, uh, that are going to be having babies soon are, are eastern cottontails, um, squirrels, and raccoons, like Chrissy already had mentioned. So um, we're going to mostly fo focus on birds here in this program because it's Western Congo Audubon Society, but um, we do want to touch with mammals because that's a big part of what we educate on every summer. So um, baby bunnies um, are one of the two main mammals that people often think are orphaned. We'll talk about the other one later, um, but this one is... Uh, you know, often because we're primates and we're humans are primates, so our babies are always with us. Um, and we have to remember that other animals didn't evolve like we did. So our babies are always with us. You know, chimpanzee babies are always with their, their moms. Uh, but other animals evolved differently, so they survived the right way. So eastern cottontails are actually left alone all day long from dawn to dusk. And the mom only comes back and feeds them twice, once in the early morning and once late in the evening. And that's it, and she leaves them alone. That's how she keeps them safe. So often when people find baby bunnies or their dog finds them, uh, you know, they think they're orphaned and they want to bring them in and feed them. Do not feed them anything. Leave them in the, uh, leave them in the nest and call us or your local rehabber right away for assistance because they often don't need help. Yeah, and um, those baby uh, 
cattails aren't going to be in the nest very long, um, only about three weeks, so about 21 days, and they're out of the nest doing their own thing. So if you do find them uh, and you have to keep your dog away from the nest, you don't have to wait very long because it's just a few weeks before they're able to hop around on their own. Exactly, yeah. Um, and another uh, um, nesting season that's happening right now are the water birds. So geese, ducks, um, gulls are all starting to claim territory soon. I know with the snow, um, that totally changed their whole behavior. But before the snowstorm, I was seeing Canada geese paired up at their, in their normal nest locations. Um, herring and ring-billed gulls are, are, are starting to claim territory and, and do their courtship bonding. So um, that's going to happen pretty soon. Um, Throughout March, you'll have uh, you, you, end of March really. You'll have a lot of animal, a lot of the birds already on their nest, um, and uh, you know it, it all depends on the species and stuff. But average waterfowl um, nest nest uh, incubation is about 28 days. Um, so one of the main, I think you can go to the next uh, slide, Justin. One of the main things with with birds is, in most birds, is they have to lay an egg a day or an egg every other day until there's a full clutch. Most species um, that we'll talk about in a little bit here on how to tell what, how, they, how the babies grow up, but some species um, lay an egg a day and start incubating right away, and most other species lay an egg a day until there's a full clutch, and then they start incubating, because if you start incubating right away, the egg starts growing right away, and the baby, you know, the baby bird's growing in there, and that's not helpful with birds like mallards or Canada geese that have to walk other babies, you know, from one place to another. So they'll lay an egg, an egg a day in a very quiet, hidden place. Most, place. most people don't even know there's a mallard nest in their yard until you're gardening and then she flies up in your face and scares the heck out of you and you realize there's a nest in there. So, um, you know, she'll lay an egg, an egg a day until there's a full clutch and then she'll, she'll start incubating. So usually around end of March, beginning of April is when that, that's pretty much done and then they start incubating. So um, most, most you know, mallards will most of the time uh, nest on the ground in, in thick shrubbery, but sometimes they'll nest in trees. Um, wood ducks nest in trees, and other diving ducks nest in trees too. So it's pretty interesting, but for the most part, they're going to be in a little hidden, hidden bush in your yard. Um, a lot of times it's that real tall grass. I don't know if you know what that grass is, Christine, that people often have in their yard, but it's, uh, it's real tall, and, and they often nest in the middle of that. You don't even know the nest is in there. Um, so she'll, she'll incubate those eggs until, uh, for about 28 days, and then it takes about 24 hours for them to hatch, and kind of get all dried off and ready to walk around. So they'll be in the nest for a little while once they hatch. Uh, the mom will sit on them and keep them warm. Um, and then once she's ready to walk with them, they will walk up to a mile or more away from their nest site to, their, to the water source where she wants to raise those babies. Some species evolve differently, which we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, mallards will, will have a, a clutch of around 7 to 14 babies. And one interesting thing about ducks is they do what's called egg dumping. So one hen will find another duck's nest, and she'll lay her eggs in there too. So um, that way she can pass on her genes to another nest that can be cared, cared for in case her nest has been preyed on. Uh, that way she still has her babies too to continue that gene pool. Another interesting thing is they've done studies on clutches, and there's, there's many different fathers throughout that clutch. So that also helps the genetic pool to, uh, to, to be diverse. Um, but once she hatches those babies, she's going to walk them from, from, from her, her nest site to the water source. And the reason why um, duck species evolve this way is because there's usually, besides I think the, the whistling ducks, most ducks are alone and they're caring for their babies. So just the hen mallard is the one that's doing the raising. Um, and so if she nested near water, that would be more of a chance for a predator to find her while she's on the nest um, or find the, uh, the, the eggs while, while she's actually um, laying still. Uh, like mink and, and fox, raccoon, things like that. But if she nests farther away from water, it gives her a chance to keep those babies that nest safe while she's doing incubation and then, you know, the nest laying and egg laying. But then that also causes problems when she's walking from there to the water source, especially now that humans are here and we've messed up the whole landscape and put cities and streets and sewers. And so probably the number one, number one reason we get ducklings in every year that are orphaned is because the mother was hit by a car watching her babies from the nest site to the water source she was going to raise. And the second reason is because they all fell in the sewer and the mother was hit by a car because of that, or she walked away with most of her babies and some are still stuck in the sewer. So that's one of the two number one reasons we get orphan ducklings every year. 
If you find a duckling or gosling uh, or any baby bird alone, call us right away before you intervene. But ducks and, ducks and geese we know are supposed to be with their mother the whole time for the most part. So if you find one, a duckling or gosling alone, put it in a box, no food or water, and call us right away um, because they, uh, that's, that it's, it's important that they're with their, their mother or they're on heat because they, they won't survive if they're cold. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. That's a Canada goose nest. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, ducks getting caught in um, courtyards? Oh yes, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. So another thing that we get calls on often is is ducks will mallards usually will nest in a courtyard. Sometimes it's geese, but it's mostly mallards. And if you think about it, courtyards usually planted with a, a lot of nice you know uh, greenery, um, a lot of habitat in there. Usually there's a little fountain. Um, and that's a great place for a mallard to lay her clutch because it's safe from predators for the most part. But she didn't evolve with buildings, so she doesn't understand that she can't get those babies out. So once they hatch, we often get calls that there's a duck that has babies in the courtyard. And what we recommend doing is if you can safely do this, walk them from, a, there's usually a door that leads into the courtyard. So you'll walk the babies through that door and out another door through the building, and then she'll take it where she wants to go. Because she doesn't want to raise them in the courtyard, um, but she doesn't know how to get them out because they can't fly for eight weeks. So um, some places like to watch them grow up in there, but that's not the best thing for the babies. We have many, many, many situations that, that end up badly because there's not enough food in there, or it gets too hot, or there's not enough water, or they're, or they're feeding you know, the residents that are, that are living there, uh, or, or to going to school there, feed them bread and other things that are really bad for them. So it ends up pretty badly. So, um, yeah, it's a good, good thing, Christine, you reminded me about that. So, um, you know, just walk them out. You just kind of walk slowly behind the mom. She'll walk away from you, and she'll walk those babies right through the, the hallway um, out into the other door, and then she'll take them where she wants them to go. That's, that's a good – I forgot about that. Good thinking. Um, so if you know of a nursing home or a school that does have one of those enclosed courtyards, um, please feel free to give them our information, uh, let them know, especially if they see a mallard that's trying to nest there, let them know that it's a good idea to call us right away. So we're talking about that nice open area that's completely surrounded by building. Their only way into that open area is to go through the building. That's when the animals get into trouble. Exactly. Um, like I said, Canada geese sometimes nest in courtyards, but it's very, it's very rare. I think I've only had it happen one time that I can remember. Um, so that's a Canada goose nest there. Um, you know, they, they cover, the female will cover the nest during the day when she's still laying, or if she leaves, she'll usually leave, leave once a day to, to go get water and food quickly, uh, but they, they gain fat reserves um, before they nest so they can sit there for 28 days and pretty much not move. Next slide, Justin. There she is sitting on her nest, looking all awesome. I love Canada geese. They're my favorite bird of all time, of course. <laughs> Go ahead, next one. Um, and uh, one thing that we often hear is that Canada geese are mean. I think if you talk to anybody in your family or your friends and you say something about Canada geese, the first thing they're going to say is, is they're mean. And I say they're good parents. So there's a difference between being mean and being a good parent. So I often tell people, well, if you had your kids out in a park and someone ran up to your kids, what would you do? And she, then they would say, I would fight and protect my kids. And I said, that's what the geese are doing. So just don't go near their nest and you won't get attacked. <laughs> um, they're just really good parents. And so that's why, you know, with mallards, you see they usually have around anywhere from 7 to 14 babies, where Canada geese have around 5 to 7 of their own babies. And uh, most of that clutch survives because, as you know, you know, the male goose, the gander, is very protective of his goose and his babies. And uh, that's why most of them survive the flight. So... Um, usually, you, you know, there's, there's, they don't have much loss with that because they're such good parents. So they're not really mean. They're just really good parents, and they're, they're protective, and, and that's why they're so successful. If you don't believe, if you believe it or not, in the, early in the early 19th century, Canada geese were endangered and rare in Ohio. We ba barely had none in Ohio. Um, they, were, they, were extinct, they were almost extinct. Uh, they were extirpated, actually, from, from the state from overhunting. But then the Division of Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service worked to get the Canada goose population back in Ohio, and now they're, they're very prevalent and they're everywhere. So um, we, we love them. Um, when we get baby geese in that are orphaned, normally we could just foster them out to wild families. And it's, and it's pretty, pretty quick, pretty easy. The earlier you do it, the better chance you have. Most of the time it's that, that, that part when they're walking from their nest to the water. Often geese will nest right next to water, so it's not that common with them, but when they're walking around, 
sometimes they'll fall in a sewer or just one will be left behind and then they end up being orphaned. Maybe they're just too weak after hatching. And I think that's the number one reason why we get orphaned Canada geese is because they're just, they're just too weak. And so we'll keep them for a day, you know, make sure they're warm, um, and then make sure they have, a, um, they have other geese in there. We'll actually use d goose decoys in there so they can imprint on that, that parent goose that's fake. <laughs> And then we get them fostered with, with another family, and it, they run right with them, and it's, it's, it's perfect. Um, we, we never raise young geese here for, for too long because we just feel like um, it's the best thing for any baby animals to, raise, to be raised by its natural family or, secondly, a foster family. So we'll talk about fostering a little bit later, but with Canada geese, we, we foster all of our babies. So um, it's much better to get them out there with, their, with, with those new, new parents. You want to start this one off, Christine? Sure. Um, ah, the scarlet tanager. <laughs> Love it. Um, when the uh, when we're doing mating season and trying to uh, mark out the territory, we've got these lovely bright males, um, really trying to show off, and they're also trying to uh, scare away other males. They don't want a whole bunch of other birds in their territory. Um, competing for food or competing for the ladies. So a lot of times um, if a really strong aggressive male like scarlet tanagers, um, we've seen robins do this um, and a couple of other bird species as well. When they see another male in their territory, they're going to attack that male. Um, for us, when we look in the mirror, we're like, oh, look at me, I'm so pretty, right? <laughs> that bird looks in the mirror and does not realize that it's him. He sees this big, strong male, what he's really seeing is himself, but he sees this other big, strong male in his territory, and he wants to get that guy out of there. So whether he's seeing it in the reflection of your sliding glass doors or the reflection in this picture of the vehicle, um, what he's trying to do is trying to scare away that other bird, which is really just his reflection, but he doesn't realize that. So we'll get a lot of this bird's constantly running into my window and constantly attacking it and um, just over and over and over again. With shiny surfaces on the outside of your home, it's really hard uh, to stop this behavior. So people will try to put something on the inside. And of course, with, a, with like a piece of paper or something on the inside, it doesn't stop the reflection. So to get this to really stop, what you'd have to do is cover the outside with a non-reflective surface, something that's matte, that's not going to allow for that reflection, that uh, will stop the bird from attacking because he won't be able to see that reflection to be able to attack it. Um, and then he can put his uh, aggression and his territory, territorial, his protection of his territory um, in the right area and be protecting from actual other birds and males um, as opposed to trying to protect his area from, well, himself. Yep, and, and, and as Christine said, this, this is uh, something that's kind of funny because normally before the songbirds really start nesting, which should be pretty soon, you know, through March, we'll get this call, there's a bird trying to get in my house, and I know exactly what they're doing. I'm like, can I guess what's going on? And we guess that it's a robin attacking the window, and we're always right. So um, as Christine said, they're just attacking the reflection. And that starts to baby season. So um, they're, they're claiming territory, like Christine said, um, and oftentimes when they're aggressive like that, they're already building a nest or already have a nest going. So that usually starts around April, um, th depending on the species, but typically that starts around April. Um, most incubation for songbirds is about 14 days, and then the, the babies are out of the nest about two weeks later. So it's a pretty quick process. So normally what we tell people in that situation is just calm down and, and understand they're not trying to get in your house. They usually don't hurt themselves, and that they will eventually move on once their nest is is once the babies hatch because they'll be too busy feeding the babies to, to be attacking their windows. And it's baby bird time. <laughs> so, um, you know, we see so many different babies throughout the, the, the baby season, the busy season here, um, and most of them don't need help. Um, that's one of the number one things that we, that, we have to, that we have to kind of sort out through the phone or through email is what, what the person's situation is. Um, because as we said before, our babies are always with us, so it's hard to understand why an American robin would leave their baby on the ground, or a great horned owl, or a green heron, um, as you see in these photos. And, and there's a northern cardinal on the top right there, and an American robin on the bottom left with a brown-headed cowbird with his little belly sticking out. 
Um, great old owls are actually already on the nest right now and may already have babies. Um, and so when great horns get a little bit older, like this fuzzy guy there, um, they actually will leave the nest and they'll, they can actually climb down the tree with their, with their, their talons and their bill and they'll walk around the ground. I mean, they're fuzzy like that. And they'll just hop around the ground. And if you know anything about great horned owls, they are the tiger of the sky. They're very strong. They're very, very tough. And the parents are very protective, just like the geese are. So most animals don't really mess with great horned owls. They're just, they're just pretty much top predator. Um, so it's very common to find babies on the ground. And most of them are OK. But always call us first. Like, like we had said, um, if you have a question, or I'll call your local rehab or nature center to find out what you should or should not do. Uh, but it's very common for babies to be on the ground because most species of songbirds, when they leave the nest, they just flutter to the ground and they can't fly because their muscles aren't built enough and their feathers aren't still fully grown. Um, and so it's always good to know if you have a nestling or a fledgling that's on the ground first before you intervene. No food or water. We always want to keep saying that. <laughs> this is a, uh, an American robin chick that was... Uh, fed something. I don't know what it was fed, but it's all over its feathers, all over its eyes, all over its body. And, you know, people have the best intentions. So we, we never want to, you know, be negative to the, to the public, but we are very honest in that we don't want to feed her water because most of the time they don't know what the animal they have eats naturally, but also the thing that, things that they're feeding them are not a natural thing. Um, birds don't drink milk. They're not mammals. And so often they get fed milk or they get fed jello or they get fed smoothies or all kinds of other weird and things. Cat food. For some reason, on the internet, when you look stuff up, it says, feed them cat food. Don't feed them cat food. Cat food is for cats. <laughs> it is never, ever for birds. Right, exactly. And, and you know, it's, it's, there's so many different species and so many different things that, that rehabbers have to really think about that. That's why we're always educating on no food or water because even though an animal um, might need some food if it's really skinny, if you give an animal food right away, it could actually put it into shock and cause organ failure. Just like if you're ever sick and you're in the hospital, they don't bring a full, you know, chicken dinner to you. Um, you know, when you're going to eat, they start off with fluids first, and then they start with jello and pudding and things like that because it, your, your body's weak. And so same thing with animals, and that's, that's one of the other reasons, um, one of the main reasons. But other reasons is we don't know what the animal's, what's wrong with them, if he's rolling around, if he's neurological, if he can't stand. Uh, I've often had people bring in a baby animal or an animal that's in need and it falls in that bowl of water in the enclosure that they bring it in and then, then the animal's hypothermic and sometimes they're already dead on, on intake and um, that could be preventable with no food or water. So that's, that's why we always educate on that. So this is one of the things that we always have to kind of sort out on the phone um, is, you know, should these be on the ground? And there are, uh, I think in this photo, there's technically four different species, um, but only three. You can only see really three. And um, two of those should not be on the ground. Uh, or two, or one of those should not be on the ground, but the other two should be. So um, the Cooper's hawk in the top right there, he's a little bit young to be out of the nest. When raptors are, are, uh, are, are um, growing up, they get into a stage that's called a branchling stage, like that, that Cooper's is almost there where they're in the nest, they're, they're flapping their wings, but they're not flighted yet. And so they'll jump from branch to branch, building those wing muscles up as their feathers continue to grow. And this Cooper's hawk was probably just too eager to get food from his parents and fell to the ground and came in for a day or two. And then we got him back in the nest. Once he was able to hop up to the, you know, in the branching stage, he can just hop up. That middle cute little thing there, most people would never see those. That's a common nighthawk chick. Um, they often nest on the ground around rooftops. Um, and uh, they're supposed to be on the ground. The mom usually has two babies, and she keeps them usually kind of in a little hidden spot, um, often in like power plants, um, on school roofs, things like that, where they can kind of blend into the, the, usually the rock, the rocks that are on top of the roof, and, and that's normal. This guy actually was rescued in 2019 uh, with the best intentions, but it actually was a negative situation for the Nighthawk. So that bird was taken from his mother, at a power plant, and uh, the guy had called and said, I have a baby bird that's, that's orphaned, um, and he had brought it to us, but then wouldn't take it back. Um, I told him this bird's fine, it's healthy, and he wouldn't take it back. He says it's not safe, and he wouldn't call us back. So that was really unfortunate, because that bird was actually healthy and should have been left with his mother, um, but it wasn't, unfortunately. On the left-hand side there, you see those, those, those are all little cedar waxing chicks. 
Um, they have that real beautiful magenta color inside their mouth. Those are supposed to be on the ground. So, you know, like I said, most, most songbirds leave the nest around two weeks old. They hop around the ground for a few days, and the mom and dad come down and feed them, give them all the food they need, and then that's just a learning point for them. You know, it is a very vulnerable time for them. They do get preyed on by a lot of, you know, a lot of na native animals like raccoons and hawks and, and even squirrels um, and cats we talked about last week. You know, always keep your kitties indoors. It's safer for them and safer for our native wildlife. Um, but that's the number one reason we get in young, or young songbirds every summer is because they're attacked by cats. So there's three different types of baby birds. So there's altricial, which, are, um, which means that the babies are completely helpless after they hatch. They need everything from the parents. They need food, they need warmth, they need protection, and they need the, they need the food brought to them um, from, from their parents or parents. Um, you know, this, these top right uh, um, photos, those are American robin chicks. Um, they are completely helpless. Same with this uh, red-tailed hawk in the bottom left there. They're totally, totally helpless, and they need everything from the parents. Then there are semi-precocial. So semi-precocial are um, herons, gulls, um, probably the nighthawks, other species that, that um, they rely on the parents for food and protection, but they can feed themselves. So, you know, gull chicks... Um, terns, herons, things like that will bring food to the babies. Um, they can kind of walk around in a little territory that the parents claim, um, but they, they rely on that food source from the parents. So they can, the, the parents will go feed at a landfill or at the lake and then they'll come back and regurgitate food and the babies will eat it up off the ground or from the mother's bill or father's bill, but they are dependent on the, that, that parent for food and protection, but they can eat it on their own. And then we have precocial. So these are species that can feed on their own. Um, pretty much once they hatch, they can walk around and they can follow the parents. And they're feeding themselves, but they rely on those, those parents to keep them, keep them warm when they're cold and show them, you know, kind of where to, where to find food. But they feed themselves. So like, you know, geese, ducks, swans, turkeys, killdeer, things like that, uh, plovers, all the other different species like that. They are precocial. So that means that they're fully capable of doing everything on their own. They just need the, you know, protection and warmth from the parents. You want to start this one, Christine? Sure. Um, one of the big ones that we see is uh, those robins. They're all over the place. They're everywhere. Um, we see things like uh, starlings, uh, all kinds of birds as they're starting to come out and starting to fledge. Uh, when you see them hopping out of the nest, and that's one of the things that we get is, oh, my gosh, this bird fell out of the nest. Um, it is okay to scoop up a bird and put it back in the nest. If it continues to hop out, if you're continuing to find it on the ground, chances are that bird is supposed to be out of the nest. Uh, as Tim said, we've got uh, birds out on the ground. They're fledging. They're on the ground for a couple of days. In that nest, if you look, you've got all those little birds squunched together. There's not a lot of opportunity there for them to build those flight muscles to really get those wings working, and they need to have those nice, strong muscles in order to be able to fly. Uh, so this time that they're on the ground, they're flapping, they almost look injured sometimes the way they flap around on the ground, unable to get up into the air. Um, that's really going to help to build those muscles. Now, yes, they're on the ground. There are predators around. It is a dangerous part of their life, um, but this is when they're learning how to avoid those predators. They're learning how to um, find any of those food resources that might be on the ground. At this point in time, mom and dad are still there. They're still taking care. So if you are not where mom and dad can see you, because mom and dad won't come down if you're right there, but if you're not where mom and dad can see, you can actually watch and see that mom and dad are still coming down to take care of these babies um, and help them to uh, learn how to find their food and they're going to be really working on those wing muscles. Uh, so that's a really, really important part of their lives. Um, without that, it's going to make the amount of time that it takes for them to learn how to fly much, much longer. A lot of people at this stage are like, well, it's dangerous. I just want to bring them in. You take care of them until they can fly. In the wild, it may only take a few days, and they're up flying and doing the things that they're supposed to. If that baby is here in rehab, it's going to take them a lot longer to get to that stage where they can fly, eat on their own, and be released. So what you're doing by taking this animal out of the wild and trying to protect it is you're actually um, 
you're making their learning curve take a lot longer and you're reducing the chance of success that they're going to have in the wild on their own. So we always want to leave whenever possible those babies out there, even though it may seem like a dis uh, dangerous situation to you. Exactly, and this is a good uh, um, different uh, the differences between if a bird's supposed to be on the ground or not. And oftentimes we have people call and they say we have a baby blue jay on the ground, um, and it, we think it needs help. And so th what they're actually seeing are the pin feathers growing, like on that bottom left photo, that that common grackle chick there. That guy's still nestling. He should not be on the ground. If you're seeing that many pin feathers and he's still kind of squatting on the ground and not able to stand up like the robin on the right there, he probably needs to get back, put back in his nest um, and, uh, and, and, you know, put back with his family. Um, or um, we can make an artificial nest, which we'll talk about in a second. But that's kind of one way to tell. If, if a baby bird's on the ground and it's hopping around, it's probably fine. It's always good to call to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're getting the right thing because sometimes when people call, and they send us photos, we learn a lot more than what we would actually see just by talking to someone on the phone. So with the internet, it's great to be able to get a photo sent to us quickly. Um, most people have smartphones by now. They can sh shoot a couple photos over to us. We can confirm. But that common grackle check there on the bottom left, that bird needs to get put, put back in the nest. They often nest in arborvitaes. So when you have a grackle check on the ground, um, often it's, it's, the nest is right there somewhere because that bird can't go far because he can't really walk around. Um, where that, that American robin chick there on the top right, that bird was brought in 2010. Um, and he was fine. He was healthy. The, the people were worried that he was, you know, going to get eaten by a predator. And it's possible, but that's not our job to make sure that wildlife, you know, doesn't get eaten in the wild. I mean, that, they're just, that's part of nature. It's part of the food chain. And we shouldn't stop that unless it's cat or dogs, of course. Um, but, you know, other than that, it's, we need to let them do what they need to do. And, and they survive. And, and American robins are one of the most common birds that have mutations like that out there. I've seen a few of myself in the wild, and it's pretty cool. You want to talk about reed nesting, Christine? Yeah, uh, this will be the last uh, thing that I jump in on here. Uh, squirrels are found on the ground a lot, especially after big storms. Now, squirrels, it, we're coming on spring. So we can find baby squirrels in the spring, but you can also find them in the fall as well. So there'll usually be two times of year that these baby squirrels are born. Um, and really, depending on the type of squirrel, they're with mom um, and then on the ground within maybe three months for a fox squirrel. Gray squirrels are on the ground running around in about 10 weeks. Um, red squirrels, uh, you know, they're really moving quickly and growing fast. But when they're little, they still need mom's help. Now, squirrels spend a lot of their time, as you know, up in trees. So that's where they feel comfortable. So if there's a baby squirrel on the ground, mom isn't going to be as likely to go down and grab that baby. When she's on the ground, she is an easy catch for other predators. But if you get that baby up into the tree uh, where mom can get to it, she's much more likely to come and grab that baby because that's where she feels safe. Uh, not as many predators can follow her into the tree or they can't climb the tree as well as she can. So if you can get that baby up off the ground, that's really important. Now there's some things to remember when trying to get that baby squirrel back into the tree. Obviously you're not going to be able to reach the nest. Um, so we recommend that you get something nice and sturdy, uh, something that's plastic, not paper. You don't want something that's going to fall apart. So a cardboard box isn't really going to be your friend. Um, but something plastic, if it's supposed to rain, poke some holes in the bottom. And then you want to line it with something that's going to help keep the baby warm. Now, here's the thing. Don't put towels in there, not paper towels, nothing that's going to like absorb that moisture because now that you've, that rain is in the, in the container and it's now been absorbed um, by those towels. So you don't want to do that. You want things that are going to stay dry, stuff that the water's just going to roll right off of. Uh, so things like leaves, grasses, things that aren't going to absorb that moisture. And that's what you want to line that nest with. Now, if it's really, really cold out, you might take a small water bottle or pop bottle, um, and you can fill that with warm water. And if you use a slightly larger container than, um, say, a butter container, maybe you're using something a little bit bigger, uh, like a coffee container to put the baby into, um, you can put warm water in there and put that in with the baby to help keep that baby warm. Uh, and give the mom a chance to come and get that baby. Again, these guys are going to learn what they need to a lot faster with mom than they can with us. Humans are never the best replacement. Mom, no matter what kind of animal, is going to do a hundred times better than any human could do trying to step in 
and take mom's place. Exactly, and like like this uh, this this bottom left corner, you can see where they hole, poke the holes in there. That's so the water drains out, and this works for baby birds too, uh, <clears throat> um, not just squirrels. Um, but this is often we tell people to to uh, you know re-nest baby birds. Bye, Christine. She's got to leave our program, so we're gonna I'll continue fi the finishing the program up. Um, but uh, baby birds can be re-nested. The one main thing we want to remember is that nestlings. If they're a hatchling where they don't have any feathers, they don't have any, uh, any way to keep themselves warm, and they can't get back in the original nest, that bird will have to go to a rehabber because um, the, parent, the parents can only really incubate one nest at a time. So if they're a nestling, where they're like that common grackle we, we saw earlier, that bird's supposed to be on, uh, you know, he can thermoregulate himself better than a hatchling can. So um, it's always good to call us first and, and, and get that, you know, get to figure out what you're dealing with. So... Um, and these are just kind of some photos we can uh, flip through quickly. We have some uh, hummingbirds uh, that came in a few years ago. Those are kind of hard to re-nest because their nest is so specific. Um, that's a quarter there in the bottom right. So that's the, you can see how little those guys are. Uh, next slide. That's them just uh, about a week later. They, they grew really quickly, and um, we were able to release both of those guys, actually four that year, um, and I think it was 2014. And uh, that they were able to, they came to our feeders for a while after that release, and they did well. So that's one bird that's a little bit tricky to, to re-nest. Another one that's really tricky to re-nest are chimney swifts. We always get a call um, around, you know, around June, uh, July that we have baby, uh, there's, there's baby animals in my chimney and we think it's a raccoon and, and it's normally baby chimney swifts. And uh, it often, the, the nest falls from the roof of the, from the wall of the chimney or just the baby falls down. And if they're old enough like these guys here, on the left, you can actually just kind of pick them up and, and place them back on the wall of the chimney, and they should be able to scurry back up to the nest. But oftentimes, they're just too young, and they don't have that, that grip yet, and they, they need to come to a rehabber uh, to be cared for. Here's some photos we can just kind of flip through of nestling birds that are, uh, they're, uh, they're not nestling, fledgling birds that are out in the, in the wild on their own, and they're, they're, they're fine. They're, they're supposed to be alone like that. There's a red-winged blackbird chick there, you know, doing this fun thing. There's an American robin. A blue jay, uh, and these are red-winged blackbird chicks in the nest. So those guys are almost out of the nest yet, but they're still, still, still getting there. Um, but they, you know, they just—they're supposed to be on the ground. That's, that's, you know, that's just what they do when they're fledglings. Um, another thing that we do often here at the center is we foster baby birds. So this barred owl chick on the left here uh, came in, uh, you know, really, really emaciated um, and weak. And once we got him better, the the founder didn't know where the nest was and didn't know where he came from. So we're able to foster this barred owl chick with the, the pair up right out back here at the center. Um, if you go to the next photo, Justin, um, that bird that we foster is the bird in the middle there. Um, that that bird is a wild bird uh, that that we that was in rehab that we fostered, and now he's being cared for by his foster parents. The parents can't count, so they don't know how many kids they have. I know if you came home and there's an extra kid, you'd be wondering where that kid came from. But the owls don't really know that, so they just keep caring for him. And, and we've we've done this. Pretty much every year since we figured out we could do this with the pair out back here at the center, um, one year we gave them three chicks, and normally they only have about two or three, and they had two of their own that year, and they raised all five chicks all the way to the flight, and, and they did well. So it's really cool. So as Christine said, it's much, much better for those birds or any animal to be raised by their natural parents, and then it's always last, last case scenario to be raised by people. So we do a lot of fostering, especially with, with geese, um, uh, you know, barred owls, robins, other songbirds, they, they take babies pretty, pretty easily and they don't even know that, they're, that, they're, that they're, they're not their own. They just keep taking care of them and they do their thing. So that's the best thing we can do for them. One thing I'll touch on quickly is another animal that's often uh, mistaken for being orphaned is the white-tailed deer. Um, that, that mom leaves that baby alone all day long and for, for days. They'll be in the same spot for two weeks sometimes, in the exact same spot. Um, and uh, you know the next slide, Justin. Um, they're often in schools or under your car, um, on your porch, um, in your flower gardens, and that's normal. That's that's what they're supposed to do. They white-tailed deer evolved to to grow up in the the woodlands that used to be here on the eastern part of the United States that are now leveled, and we have houses and condos and things like that. So you know we evolved much quicker than these deer did. So they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're just in our urban areas now. So. They, they, those white spots um, naturally simulate the the the, uh, the sunlight coming through the floor onto the forest floor from the from the canopy. It really blends in. It really looks like 
like the forest floor, but it doesn't blend in real well um, next to a school or next to your house. Um, so um, they just leave them alone. As long as they're quiet, they're being cared for, and that's all you need to do. But if you're worried, always call us. But they're 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 totally fine alone on on their on their on their themselves. That's how they keep safe. So um, you know, like we said, we always reiterate: if you have an animal or a question, always call us first. Um, we are still taking in animals by appointment right now because of uh, COVID protocols. So we want to keep you and us safe. So uh, we're taking animals by appointment, so we're not having just drop-offs like we normally do. So always call us first. Um, you know, then we can talk to you if the animal does need help, and we can go from there. Um, you can see right there our phone number is there, um, or you can email us at wildlife.lanfc.org. Um, and so we really appreciate you guys, um, you know, uh, sitting with us and, and listening to our programs. And it's awesome that Betsy recorded it, so you can watch it over and over again if you have a question. Um, and so you know, we're here to to take any question you have. No question, silly. Uh, we want to be able to help and, and educate on what we do on a daily basis here at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. And uh, we're going to switch our slides over uh, in just a moment. And here we are. Thank you, Tim Jasinski, Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist, and Christine Barnett, Wildlife Program Specialist, both uh, at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center based in the Bay Village uh, Cleveland, Ohio area. Um, I want to remind you uh, that you can go and watch all of the programs, uh, these February programs, on YouTube. Uh, we do have them at the wcaudubon.org uh, YouTube channel, which you see on the slide on your screen. I've circled uh, some of the programs that Christine and Tim have recorded during the month of February. Before we leave, I would like to remind you and invite you again to please make a generous donation to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. I like to say that wildlife rehabilitation specialists are some of today's unsung heroes and heroines, and we certainly have two here today. So working under tremendous pressure, they continue to aid and assist injured wildlife despite the crippling effects of climate change that are now compounded by the social and economic complications of COVID-19. So I'm going to go just briefly go down the ways that you can make a donation. Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I've listed the tax ID uh, there for you. And you can go to the top yellow highlighted link to make a direct donation to the center. Uh, the second thing you can do is, if you're on Facebook, to go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center Facebook page. And at the top of that page, you'll see a bright blue Donate button. Click on that and it will take you to a way that you can make a direct donation to the center there. The third way that you can make a donation is to send a check and send your check to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, Attention Wildlife Rehabilitation Staff, 28728 Wolf Road in Bay Village, Ohio, 44140. And you can learn more about the center and all the great things that it does uh, at wcaudubon.org. Uh, we have different articles there, one of which I've listed at the bottom of the slide. And also go to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center website, of course, lanfc.org. So we would like to thank you uh, for attending today and for coming to the other programs we posted in February. Uh, and please make that donation to the center. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm.